Is this working? Great. Mike, uh, w why don't you give me a, you know, when you start streaming and then I'll start. We're going? All right. Excellent. Welcome, everyone, to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos, whoever you are, wherever you are on your life's journey. Whatever you believe, whomever you love, you are welcome here. My name is James Carroll. I'm a religious education instructor here at the church. I normally teach classes in comparative religion and sometimes in the Bible. Uh, today, though, uh, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, it's climate change. Um, this is a very difficult topic, and I'm going to briefly mention some of, just a few of my thoughts on the, on the matter. Um, I grew up with a father who was very... He, he built windmills uh, for a living, but he also worked in nuclear power, and, and he, had a, he had an interesting approach, uh, uh, take on environmentalists. He said, environmentalists are people who already have a cabin in the woods and don't want anyone else to have one either. Um, and uh, I, I, I grew up that way, and I now consider myself an environmentalist. Um, but I've always felt like, um, like some of the things he said should be taken to heart. I want to be the right kind of environmentalist. We often talk about the economy versus the environment, and we frame that as uh, rich people's 401ks versus the world we're going to leave our children. And I'm an environmentalist because I care about the world I'm going to leave my children. Um, but the economy isn't about just about rich people's 401ks. It's also about um, the single mother who's working to make ends meet. And so uh, I believe... Uh, my father used to derogatively call liberals bleeding heart liberals, and my heart bleeds. Uh, I'm, I'm a liberal person because I believe in caring for the, the people who are struggling, because I love people and I want to care for people. And so climate change is a very difficult subject to tackle because we have to balance caring for those people um, with the environment and the environment's damage it does to vulnerable people. Um, it's often said that climate change will harm the most vulnerable among us. The poorest people in the world live in places most impacted by climate change. This is true. If we damage the economy trying to solve climate change, we will also damage some of the most vulnerable people in the world. So how do we do both? And usually this is a very pessimistic view. Um, today we're gonna, there's a, a, an organization who has put together a list of climate solutions we're going to watch their videos and just uh, the idea then would be to watch them and discuss them. But there were too many for one forum. So we're going to do this in two forums. Um, what that means, though, is that today we're mostly going to watch videos. And then the next one, we're going to finish the videos and then have a place for open discussion. The problem with that means not a lot of open discussion today. And we want that open discussion and feedback. But there's not a lot of time for it today. So Tyler has been passing around um, cards that you can use to write down some of your thoughts so you remember when next week comes around what your thoughts were about the first bit, uh, and then you can, um, can respond in the next, uh, next week's um, lecture. It's a very data-driven approach, which uh, I obviously like. I, I love looking at data, especially when the data isn't just about the problems, but about what some of the solutions might be and how they might work. So um, with that, I think we're going to watch uh, the first one. The, oh, by the, I should point out the other thing Taylor is, is point, bringing around is a, is a sheet that will help you uh, calculate your own carbon footprint if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, Cook can uh, uh, introduce that for us. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to take one of those if you're interested. And um, we will watch this video. We may have time for maybe five minutes of questions at the end uh, and comments at the end. But then we'll have a lot more time uh, next week for more comments. So let's watch the first one. I think there's an introduction that's like a minute. Is that right? And then there's another one that's a little bit longer. And there are a series of six of these. Um, and uh, the place to find them is at, a, at an organization called drawdown.org. So these all come from drawdown.org. Um, this is their list of solutions. You can go there yourself, and, and they have a lot of other resources beyond just, just these. Hi, I'm John Foley, the Executive Director of Project Drawdown, the world's leading resource for climate solutions. And today I want to talk to you about the Drawdown Roadmap, a new approach to implementing climate solutions based on science. And science is important because it's what we use to help understand and predict the world around us. And science has actually been crucial in understanding climate change and warning us about its potential impacts. 
In fact, the science of climate change goes back to the middle of the 19th century, when scientists first predicted that increasing levels of so-called greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, would cause a warming impact on our planet, shifting our climate into a new regime. And as greenhouse gases increased from the 1900s through to the early 21st century, we in fact have seen a warming of our planet of about one degree Celsius so far. And that may not sound like a lot, only one degree. But the last ice age, where this planet was covered in ice caps and fundamentally different than today, was only about three degrees colder than normal. We're already one degree warmer than normal and growing into the future. And it's starting to have an impact, not only in our thermometers, but on our landscapes, our water resources, our food systems, and even things like glaciers here in Alaska, where Mir Glacier now has to be renamed on the maps to Mir Lake. So science has been a critical part of understanding the problem of climate change, and maybe can help us find the way out of the problem and focusing on solutions. But as we think about solutions to climate change, we're certainly seeing a lot of activity here today and a lot of different competing claims and agendas out there. For example, go on Twitter on any given day and you'll find lots of very confident people telling you that they have the answer to climate change and we're very happy to sell it to you. But how do you know which one is the right one or maybe which mix of solutions will work best? Well, that's again where science can help guide us by looking at the solutions and asking which ones are the most effective, which ones are available now, and what are they gonna cost? And are there any trade-offs we have to be mindful of as we implement these solutions into the coming decades? So science can guide us in our way forward and point a direction for success. And that's what Project Drawdown's been all about for the last few years. We've been using science to look at the world's proposed climate solutions, and we evaluate each and every single one of them in terms of their effectiveness, whether they're available now, and what they might cost in the future. Not surprisingly, things like solar energy are shown to work incredibly well. Solar, whether it's on our rooftops or maybe utility scale solar out in large fields, is a proven renewable energy solution and today is the cheapest form of energy humanity's ever created. So this is a very good climate solution. Another good climate solution, maybe a little surprising to some folks, is tackling food waste. That's because food and agriculture and the land use it uses and all that is responsible for about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. But we throw away about a third of all the food in the world. If we didn't throw away a third of the food, maybe it doesn't have to emit so much greenhouse gases. So tackling food waste turns out to not only be a food solution, it's also a climate solution. Another climate solution that surprised folks was the importance of social interventions, especially things like educating girls and enhancing family planning. What we find here is, of course, these are for people first, elevating the lives of women and girls around the world. Absolutely, do this for people, for equity, for justice. But when you do that for people first, it turns out it can have a longer term climatic benefit as well. So we have kind of a win-win solution for people and the planet at the same time. So what we've learned so far from looking at the solutions out there using science is that first, there are lots of solutions available today. In fact, they're abundant. You can go everywhere in the world and find great climate solutions that work right now and work effectively. We also know that most of the climate solutions we need are here today. We don't have to wait for them. We can start implementing solutions right now and get a good step ahead on fighting climate change. And that's a really good thing. And Project Drawdown has done the work of cataloging all of the viable and effective climate solutions so you can know which ones work and which ones don't and which ones we could get started with today. And we've built what we call the Solutions Library, where we assembled all the important solutions, all the ones that could work today, sector by sector. For example, solutions here in electricity, looking at ways we can conserve electricity but also making it differently using renewable energy or non-carbon emitting energy sources, moving away from fossil fuels. Those are available today too, and that's incredibly exciting. We also find solutions in the food sector, looking at solutions that reduce food waste, shift diets to low carbon food sources, but also farming differently while protecting ecosystems from being cleared. 
We can also look at solutions, for example, in transportation that maybe reduce the amount of transportation we need by having more walkable cities or using video conferencing instead of flying. Those are great, but also how we can use things like electric vehicles, mass transit, and new forms of transportation that can reduce emissions there as well. All together, the Solutions Library presents about 100 different climate solutions that are ready to go right now and are viable today. But this Solutions Library only describes the potential solutions, what could be in the future, what's possible. But it doesn't tell us how we're going to implement them and scale them out into the world, how to make them real and exist now. In a way, it's kind of like we wrote a coffee table book describing the food around the world. Hey, this looks great. This is delicious. This is amazing. But it doesn't yet tell you how to make that dish. What we need now is to replace that with a cookbook, a recipe book that shows you step by step how to make that delicious food that we just saw. Maybe step one, grease the pan. Step two, chop the onions. Step three, boil the water, that kind of thing. We need that for climate change, a cookbook that describes the recipes. So that's why we're building the so-called Drawdown Roadmap. It's gonna use science not only to describe the solutions we have, but show you step by step how to implement them and scale them out into the world. And this roadmap is gonna be useful for everyone, whether you're a government or a community organization at different sizes from local to state, federal or beyond. It's also gonna be useful for businesses who are gonna be crucial in addressing climate change or useful for investors and philanthropists who are gonna be critical in deploying the money and other resources we need to combat climate change in the future. So what we have now is really kind of an incredible moment where we have numerous climate solutions that are ready to go, and now we know how to implement them. So together, we can start to face this enormous challenge of climate change that is incredibly serious and we can step up and transform the world around us, replacing old systems that don't work very well with new ones that work better and protect our planet and build a more livable future. We can create new ways of doing things, entire new paradigms of how the world could work and work better. And altogether, not just address climate change, we can build a better world while we're at it. But along the way, we have to make sure that we're using science to guide us in the right direction so we know what to do and how to do it and when to do it. And that's what the Drawdown Roadmap is going to give us moving into the future. In the next three units, we're going to do three different things. First, we're going to describe the science we need to understand to even build this roadmap for implementing climate solutions. Then we're going to show the roadmap, which is based in five different parts, kind of five dimensions of how we can implement climate solutions into the future. And then finally, we're going to show how the roadmap can be used by different groups around the world to work collaboratively to address climate change and build a better future out into the world. Taken together, we now have the tools we need to understand and address climate change by working together, implementing solutions we have today, and following a new science-based roadmap out into a better future. Grab the wrong introduction. We grab the introduction to his roadmap and this is going to be climate solutions 101. It's okay, but there might be a little bit of overlap now when we launch the next one because some of the material there is actually the same. We, we grabbed the wrong longer introduction, but I think it's all okay. Um, we'll move on to the next one, which is climate change 101, and he, it's actually not the points he just mentioned as, as he laid out what was coming next. It's actually a, a discussion of what the problem is, and then the next one will be a, a discussion of some solutions. So I'll go ahead. Hi, I'm John Foley, the Executive Director of Project Drawdown, the world's leading resource for climate solutions. And today I want to talk to you about the Drawdown Roadmap, a new approach to implementing climate solutions based on science. And science is important because it's what we use to help understand and predict So welcome to Climate Solutions 101. We're gonna get started to think about how we're gonna address climate change 
and how we're gonna solve one of the world's biggest problems. We wanna set the stage and understand how this moment in human history, this moment of climate change and climate solutions got started in the first place. When we think about human history, we have to go back a long, long time. It turns out our ancient ancestors started walking this planet about six million years ago. And during all that time, early humans and our ancestors started to affect the environment, but they did it very locally, just right around where they lived. But something really changed in the last century, especially the last 50 years or so. We began to change the entire planet all at once in several different ways. Well, one of the things that happened, of course, is there are a lot more people on the planet. We're now over seven and a half billion people walking the earth today and climbing. We also, for the first time in history, became an urban species. Over half the people on earth now live in a city. That's never happened before. We also formed a global economy that is powered by technology and international trade and has been growing faster than ever. In fact, if you look at the last 50 years, we see about a doubling of global population the economy globally grew between five and six fold. So think about that, twice as many people doing almost six times more stuff. We then use about three times more food, twice as much water, and three times more fossil fuels than we did back in 1970. In the last 50 years, we have changed more than the previous six million years. In a way, it's kind of an inflection point. It's when everything's changing. Even the way we're changing is changing right now. And unfortunately, this change in us is also changing the planet in ways that are incredibly disruptive. Some of these changes you can see by just looking out the window. They're obvious, they're really right in front of you. For example, when we cut down a forest, we go in with chainsaws and bulldozers and set things on fire. You obviously can see that. And we're doing a lot of it. If we look at the Earth from outer space, we can see forest with a satellite Here's a picture of a pretty remote part of the Amazon in Bolivia in the 1970s. And if you look carefully, there's a little dirt road running right through the middle of that forest. The very first clearings, just starting in 1975. But if we go back here about 25 years later, the whole area has been radically transformed into soybean fields. And those soybeans are being shipped all the way to China to be used as animal feed. So a global economy connecting the Amazon to Chinese pigs is clearing rainforest in a remote part of the world. And this is happening everywhere. In fact, we're seeing so far about 30% of all the tropical forests on Earth have been lost, and a lot of that in the last few decades. We also see how agriculture, just farming, is changing the world. We usually think of farming on a small scale, like an individual farmer's field. We can walk through it, we can pull up a carrot, we can look at the cows and all this kind of thing. But agriculture is now a global force. Again, if we look at it from satellite, the Earth is covered in agriculture. This map shows in green the areas where we grow our crops. That includes the plants we eat, of course, but also the plants we feed to animals, and some we feed to cars in the form of biofuels. The brown areas are where we actually raise the remaining animals, our pastures and rangelands. And if you put it all together, agriculture now covers over a third, between 35 and 40 percent, of all the land on the planet. It is now the largest ecosystem on Earth. And that's incredible. So we've changed forests, we've changed the world through agriculture, and we're also changing the nature of water across the planet. We're a pretty thirsty species. We use a lot of water on this planet for our homes to drink, and we use water in industry. And we use most of our water, though, in agriculture. About 70% of the water we take out of nature is used for just one thing, irrigation. Let me show you how that can affect the world, though. Here's a picture of the Aral Sea from the late 1960s. This is a satellite picture showing one of the world's largest inland bodies of water in the middle of Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. But the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s diverted the rivers that would feed the Aral Sea Instead, they sent that water over into the deserts of Kazakhstan to grow cotton in the middle of a desert. And this is what happened. It shut off the water supply of one of the world's great inland seas, and it disappeared. And this is not just unique to Central Asia. This kind of overuse of water resources is happening in California. It's happening in the Midwest, in the Great Plains, in our Agawala Aquifer. It happens in North Africa. It happens in Australia. 
It happens in China and everywhere. In fact, our thirst for water has massively disrupted water resources and ecosystems across the globe. So these changes we've seen in like forest and land and water, they're just plain as day. We can see them, we can photograph them, they're right in front of us. But some other changes happening to the planet were initially a little bit more subtle, especially changes to our atmosphere and to the climate of our planet. This story actually begins more or less in the 1800s. Starting back then, we began activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels and the explosion of agriculture that started to change the nature of our atmosphere. For example, we saw that CO2 levels, one of the major so-called greenhouse gases, started to increase from the 1800s till about now. And it's so far increased by about 50%. And today, greenhouse gas levels are higher than they've been for three to five million years. We've never seen something like this in any time in human existence. And later I'll talk about this, how greenhouse gases going up causes the temperature of the planet to go up. And while the greenhouse gases like CO2 have risen, so have the temperatures of our planet. In fact, the temperature of our planet is warmed by about one degree Celsius already. Initially, that was a little subtle, maybe it was a half a degree or six tenths of a degree and so on, and we could argue whether this was happening or not. But today, it is plain as day that we have changed the temperature of our planet and it's getting warmer faster all the time. We're seeing the effects of a warmer planet almost everywhere we look. One of the early signs was looking at our glaciers. Here in Alaska, we have the Muir Glacier, which now has to be relabeled Muir Lake. We also see in South America, on the other side of the world, how glaciers in Patagonia and South America are melting, forming large lakes as well. Perhaps most disturbingly, though, is changes to an entire ocean. We're seeing how the Arctic Ocean, which is usually covered in sea ice year-round, has been melting year by year by year. Here in the 1980s, we see when sea ice is at its kind of minimum in late summer, early fall, but by the early 2010s, we see a massive reduction in sea ice, which continues to this day. And soon, maybe within a decade or so, we'll have the first ice-free Arctic months in all of recent geologic time. And we're seeing a planet radically transformed by our actions. And again, this all became possible in the last 50 years or so. Scientists often call this period of time the Great Acceleration, when everything started to take off. We see population change, urbanization, globalization, and then we started clearing ecosystems like forests, and we built up more and more farms around the world. We started building huge dams and using more and more water than ever before. We also used more fertilizers and more chemicals, especially in agriculture and industry, and those changed the nature of water even at the scale of our oceans. And then, of course, we're farming the oceans. We're harvesting more fish than ever and doing what we call aquaculture or fish farms at a scale unlike anything we've ever seen. But the really scary big thing that's happening, of course, is climate change. Our use of energy, our clearing of land, and a few other things have changed the nature of the entire atmosphere forever. And those changes are gonna make the planet warmer and if we keep going, it's going to be a massive disruption to everything on the planet. Not just the thermometers, not just the polar bears, but us. In fact, climate change has the potential to hurt the most vulnerable people among us. People living right on the edge of poverty or food security or having fresh water or good safe places to live. Climate change is going to put a huge burden on future generations. People who didn't emit anything, they're not even born yet. And yet we could be leaving a giant mess on their doorstep that could last for centuries or thousands of years. Now, I wouldn't blame you one bit if you took all of this information in and said, this looks really grim and maybe it's even hopeless. I'm gonna stop you right there because it's not true. It is not hopeless at all. In fact, there are a lot of things that are getting better. At the same time, the environmental situation is getting worse. Let me remind you of a few of these. During the last 50 years, for example, humans have gotten healthier. We used to live to be about 55 years on average on this planet, just back in the 1970s. Today, the average person on Earth can be expecting to live to be over 70, 71. 
That's amazing. We also see that women have many fewer children. 50 years ago, the average woman on earth had over five children on average. Today, it's 2.4 and falling faster than anybody ever predicted. And those children are healthier with stronger families and women have more opportunities than they've had before. We also see the world is far more literate than it's ever been. Today, 86% of the world's population can read and write. Back in 1970, that was only 50%. And back in 1900, it was only 15%. And at that point, it's the highest in all of history. We are healthier, we have more rights, and we're more educated and literate than anybody who's ever lived before. We're also more urban, we're more mobile, we're more connected and less violent than any people who've ever walked before us. So this is an interesting paradox, isn't it? Some things are getting better, some things are really getting worse. A lot of people come up to me and ask like, well, so what's the future gonna be? Is it gonna be a total disaster, kind of like a Mad Max movie, some dystopian science fiction disaster film? Or is it gonna be awesome? Is it gonna be like a Star Trek movie where we pull ourselves out of this mess and build an incredible future and seize this amazing opportunity we have to become better? Which one's it gonna be? Well, the answer is, it's up to you. It's up to us. It's up to everybody. We get to build the future we want. It hasn't happened yet. We don't know what tomorrow is gonna to be because we haven't built tomorrow yet. The future is ours to choose. So we have to choose a good one. And we can choose a world if we want to, if we really put our minds to it, we still have the ability to build a future where people and nature can thrive today and tomorrow. But to get there, we're gonna to have to do the hardest thing of all. We're gonna to have to step back as a people and make our choice, to make the choice of a generation, of this moment in history. We have to choose between the people we are or the people we can be. The people like some of our ancestors who gave everything so that we could live better lives. We are capable of so much, and yet we have realized so little. What do we choose? And we could choose the world that is. That's a giant mess right now in a lot of ways. Or we could choose the world that could be an incredible world full of potential when we seize all of our creativity and energy to build the world that we want. So which one are you going to choose? Which one are we all going to choose? The future of the world and everyone who will live after us will depend on that decision. Okay, so now we're gonna look at how we can stop climate change and achieve what we call drawdown. Stopping climate change is necessary if we wanna have a better future because everything we do is connected back to climate change. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. So if we don't fix climate change, all the other things we care about in the future are gonna be a lot harder. So we need to address climate change in order to have a better future with a prosperous economy, with resilience, equity, justice, and creativity, all the things we want demand that we address climate change. And that's what we're about. I work for something called Project Drawdown, which is the world's leading resource for climate solutions. We focus on the science we need to know to address climate change and then share it with the world. But why do we use that word drawdown? What does that even mean? Well, drawdown refers to a point in time, in the future, and it refers to the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. Now, remember I told you in the last unit, greenhouse gases have been building up in the atmosphere. Here we are today at the 2020 levels. But then we can choose what happens next. On the path we're on now, we'll just continue to build up these gases, which will just warm the planet more, making the problem worse. But we don't have to do that we can bend the curve. Bending the curve on climate change means reversing the curve of growing greenhouse gases. And when we hit this point, the little blue dot here, that's the moment of drawdown. That's the moment when greenhouse gases stop climbing 
and they begin to go back down again into a healthier place. So drawdown is the moment in the future when greenhouse gas levels stabilize and stop climbing, and then they start to steadily decline. And that's when we begin to stop climate change. At Project Drawdown, our job is to get the world to drawdown as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So how do we get there? Well, first, we're gonna to have to learn a little bit of science. It won't be too hard, but it's the stuff we really do need to know to kind of get forward on climate solutions. So first of all, what are greenhouse gases? Well, you've heard a little bit about this before, I'm sure. You know that greenhouse gases kind of lit in the sun's heat and they trap the Earth's heat as Earth is radiating out into outer space. So essentially, they trap heat. And the more gases means the more heat. And that's why the planet's warming up. Pretty simple. There's a little bit more to it. It turns out that Earth already had greenhouse gases before we came along. There were natural greenhouse gases like water vapor, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and a few other things that have been there for millions, if not billions, of years of Earth history. But then we've got these things we call anthropogenic greenhouse gases, or human-caused greenhouse gases that we've been adding on top of that. And those include more carbon dioxide than was there before, more methane, more nitrous oxide. We've added chemicals that weren't even in the atmosphere before, like fluorinated gases, so-called chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, and so on, and many other gases that are impacting our climate. And we can actually see how they've been rising over the last 100, 200 years. And especially in the last few decades, we have changed the nature of Earth's atmosphere and added a human greenhouse effect on top of natural greenhouse effect. And that's where we're getting into trouble. So what do these do? It's actually really simple physics. The idea is greenhouse gases are transparent. They let solar radiation, visible light, what we can see, right through them, like just a window. You can see right through it. But in infrared radiation, which you and I can't see, it is opaque. The infrared radiation is what Earth gives off to the rest of the universe, and so it can trap that heat in the atmosphere. It kind of works like this. Imagine a version of Earth with no atmosphere at all, like the moon. It would absorb the sun's radiation and warm up. The sun's heating the ground and the ground would warm up. The ground, just obeying the laws of physics, would also give off heat or infrared radiation back to the rest of the universe, out to outer space. And without an atmosphere, this is what it would look like. The sun's heat comes in, Earth heat goes out, and they'd be in perfect balance, and we'd be at a temperature that would be accordingly in balance with that. But now let's add an atmosphere, a natural atmosphere. So we have what was the natural greenhouse effect. The idea is as Earth is radiating its heat out into outer space, some of it would be absorbed by the air above it. And some of that would then be re-radiated back down towards the Earth's surface. That has the effect of making the Earth's surface a little bit warmer and the upper atmosphere a little bit colder. And that's exactly what Earth has had and so are mainly all the other planets. Venus, Mars, and others also have a greenhouse effect kind of like that. But then humans come along and we add some more of those gases to the atmosphere. It'd be like adding another blanket on your bed in the wintertime. It traps more heat and keeps you toastier, a little bit warmer, and so on. And so this enhanced greenhouse effect traps a little bit more heat, radiates a little bit more down, and it warms the surface even more. And so far, we've warmed the planet about one degree Celsius. That doesn't sound like a lot, but think about it. During the last ice age, the planet as a whole was only three degrees colder than normal, and it was a totally different planet. This place was under about a mile of ice, in fact. We've warmed the planet in the other direction by about one degree so far, and we're gonna keep going. If we keep going to another two, three, or four degrees, that could be a world we wouldn't even recognize. It would be very, very dangerous for our civilization. So where do these gases come from? Well, I'm sure you've already heard that a lot of them come from burning fossil fuels, right? Burning oil and natural gas and coal and petroleum substitutes and all these things that we have. And that is part of the story. Burning fossil fuels does create CO2 and that causes about 62% of the warming we see on the planet today. So if you forget about everything else, fossil fuels cause more than half of climate change. But that's not all. It turns out that CO2 is also produced by a few other things. 
including chemistry. In fact, a lot of our industrial processes, especially making cement, releases CO2 into the atmosphere without burning anything at all. It's just kind of industrial chemistry. We also release a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere by burning down trees and deforestation. This green area shows you how much CO2 is caused by burning down forest, which is kind of like burning coal. Coal's dead, trees are alive, but they're both made out of carbon. And you burn them in our atmosphere, you will make carbon dioxide either way. Then we have our next greenhouse gas of methane. Methane is produced by a whole bunch of different things, but the two big sources are agriculture and industry. In agriculture, which is about two thirds of this methane emissions, is caused largely from cattle. And you've heard all the jokes before, I'm sure, about cow farts. Turns out that's not even true. Cows actually burp methane. They don't fart methane any more than other animals. The other third of this methane comes from industry, especially mining natural gas. Gas wells, fracking, gas pipelines, even coal mines release methane as well. So we have to think about energy and industry and agriculture to look at methane. Then we've got this stuff called nitrous oxide, which a lot of people don't even think about, but it's a big part of our climate change equation. And nitrous oxide, some of that comes from industry, but again, a lot of it comes from agriculture, especially using too much fertilizer or too much manure on our farmer's fields. And finally, we have F gases or fluorinated gases, which are chemicals we use as refrigerants and sometimes as insulators in industrial processes. And those refrigerants like chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons are rising dramatically. And that's why we have to pay attention to this. So putting all those gases together, we emit about 52 gigatons of the equivalent of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. What the heck is a gigaton? It's just a fancy word for a billion metric tons. So we emit 52 billion metric tons of pollution into the atmosphere every year. But there are only seven and a half billion of us. So on average, we're emitting many, many tons of pollution per person into the atmosphere. That's a huge amount. And we're going to talk more about that and how we can cut that down. Another thing we have to notice is that each of these gases works a little bit differently. Some gases trap more heat than others, like methane and nitrous oxide and those fluorinated gases trap way more heat molecule for molecule than CO2 does. But some gases last longer in the atmosphere than others too. And we got to take that into account. Like methane, we emit today, most of it will be gone within 10 to 20 years. CO2 we emit today will be in the air for centuries and centuries to come. So we have to look at the strength and lifetime of these different gases. In particular, when we think about methane, methane again is that part of the wedge of our whole diagram of greenhouse gases. If we look at the impact of today's emissions on climate for the next 100 years, methane will cause about 16% of that warming over a 100 year period. But if we look at the next 20 years instead, the role of methane doubles and becomes 32%. So it turns out in the near term, our climate changes are gonna be caused by mainly methane and other gases, but in the long term, they're gonna be dominated by things like CO2. So which gas we focus on depends a little bit on what time period of climate change you're really most concerned about. We have to look at all of them. Now that we understand what greenhouse gases are and kind of how they work, we're gonna look at what regulates the level of those gases in the atmosphere, what makes them go up and what makes them go down. To do this, sometimes it's helpful to think of a bathtub. But imagine a bathtub which we can fill and empty with water. We do that every day, right? Pretty simple. When we add water to the bathtub by turning on the faucet, we scientists call that a source. It's a source of water and it levels up the water in the bathtub. We can also remove water by opening up the drain and scientists call that a sink. You'll hear that word a lot about sinks of greenhouse gases. The difference between the sources and the sinks determines whether the water goes up or the water goes down. Sources add and make the water go up. Sinks remove and makes the water go down. Now, if you have a bathtub with the faucet on and the drain open, we have an interesting picture. If the sources are bigger than the sinks, the water level will still go up. But if the drain, the sink, is bigger than the faucet, the source, the water levels will go back down again. So let's take that and apply it to Earth's atmosphere. 
Well, Earth's atmosphere is basically a big bathtub in the sky. We can fill it with pollution and greenhouse gases, the sources of greenhouse gases, which is largely due to us. And then we have sinks of greenhouse gases, things that pull that pollution out of the sky and put it someplace else. We have sinks on this planet of greenhouse gases, primarily in plants on land, but also in the oceans. So here's the picture. We put pollution in the atmosphere, nature pulls it out in forest and in oceans. Now, right now, our sources of pollution, the stuff we're putting in the atmosphere, is much bigger than what nature can take out. And that's why the levels are going up. But what if we reduced our pollution? What if we brought it down by a half or so? Well, then maybe nature could kind of keep up with it and pull as much pollution out of the atmosphere as we're putting in. If that were to happen, we would hit that moment of drawdown and we'd stabilize CO2 levels and they'd stay flat. But we can go farther and actually reduce our pollution down to zero and pull more carbon and other stuff out of the atmosphere and actually have greenhouse gases decline and stop climate change and begin to reverse in the long term the damage we've done. So this balance between sources and sinks is what will determine the future of our planet and our climate. And let's look at the numbers. In today's atmosphere, we see that we actually have about six major sources of greenhouse gas pollution. We'll go into them later, but you see electricity and food, industry, transportation, buildings, and other stuff. Then we have nature, which on land and in the oceans pull out a total of about 41% of those greenhouse gases, primarily the carbon dioxide part. And that leaves behind 59% of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, building up year over year over year. So to achieve drawdown, to get them to reverse and bend the curve back down, we've got to work on both sides of this equation. We can work on the sources and bring them down to zero, kind of turning off that faucet over the coming decades so there's no pollution there at all. And we can also work with the sinks of carbon, starting with the natural ones that already exist, and make sure they can continue to pull that stuff out of the sky. So the idea of getting the drawdown actually will be based on three big principles, and these are important. The first thing we've got to do, and we always need to begin here, is reduce the problem before it even starts. Let's stop pollution before it even gets in the atmosphere so it doesn't cause any problems at all. And that means bringing these emissions down to zero. So we're gonna to have to zoom in and look at what causes these emissions, what's in the economy, what can we do about it in all of these different sectors from electricity to industry to agriculture and beyond. And if we do that, we can cause a big reduction in these things and eventually bring them down to zero. So job number one, stop pollution, bring it to zero. Job number two, we'll be working over in the nature space, basically supporting nature's carbon cycle and maybe even adding to it in the form of sinks. That's the right-hand side of this diagram. We'll have to zoom in here and look on land and oceans about what controls their ability to take up carbon and how can we support that and maybe even augment it, making it stronger in the future. So we've looked at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that big picture, the sources, the sinks, and we know what to do. But there's a third area we've got to talk about too, and we'll get into this later, is about how, as we improve society, we can do things that, that aren't about climate change. There's things we should do anyway. But when we improve equality and equity and justice around the world, there are things we do there that actually have major secondary climate benefits. So we might get a twofer of improving human rights and equality and contributing to climate solutions. So working together, reducing pollution, supporting nature, and improving society are the three pillars of our climate solution space. Building on these three pillars and pulling them together all at the same time, we actually have all we need to address climate change in the coming decades. And this is going to be our job over the next few units of this course.
The original plan was to watch number three today, but I think, think we're actually going to be out of time if we do that um, because we watched a longer introduction than we intended um, with a little bit of overlap. I hope that wasn't uh, too frustrating. But what that does mean is that we have, I think, a little more time today for comments and discussion than we otherwise would have. Let's talk for about five, ten minutes, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So if anyone had a, a comment or question, I'm going to pass this around. Please, or Tyler's going to help me here. Part of what's frustrating with, with opening for conversation now is that, uh, you know, the next one was about how to remove some of those sources, and of course that's the point. So we've, we've, we've kind of built up our introduction and we've just got to the punchline and, and we haven't seen the punchline, so it makes it harder to comment, but I still think it's worth passing it around and, and seeing what, what people think. So. Yes, there's a question that I always have in mind when I listen to these things, and it's sort of a grandiose view of it, namely if you're looking ahead some time, what size population will the planet support at a significantly high level of consumption? Because right now, there's a whole bunch of population that's under the level we imagine, but they're working at getting up maybe not to where we are, maybe we could go down, but the way the question is framed ultimately is one which, if you look forward, say, a century, you may have to answer some questions that they aren't willing to ask, namely numbers of people. Okay, so I think the question was population. Uh, obviously, I don't have all the answers, so it's not like you can ask me the questions and that, like we do in my religion classes, and I answer them. I'm, I'm certainly interested in seeing other people's answer to always question. Um, I, I will make one, a few quick comments. Uh, one of the things we've discovered is that is that women, as women especially, become educated, um, and as they're given greater opportunities, birth rates fall, and uh, in, in all the developed economies. Uh, the, the birth rate has fallen uh, rapidly, and it's actually a problem. Uh, we have declining populations, which are problematic, especially as that creates aging populations and not enough young kids who are working to support the older people's retirement. Uh, so uh, it, it is possible that the, the faster we help these uh, underdeveloped economies, the, the faster our population will, will at least stop growing and then whether we actually want it to shrink is, is an open question because that comes with all sorts of interesting problems. But if we don't do anything, it will actually start shrinking. And it's, we're, we're actually hitting that much faster than we thought. Uh, one of the downsides from climate change, though, he mentions, you know, this is what he means when he talks about equity. Equity will help climate change. He's right. It also is a challenge because we have a higher standard of living because we burn a lot of fossil fuels. And if you want to raise people out of poverty, to some extent, if we don't find a better way to raise them out of poverty, they're going to burn a lot more fossil fuels. Their population will stop growing, but they will burn more fossil fuels to, to, if we want to raise them to our standard of living. And again, this was, this was my uh, take on, on, um, on being an environmentalist, unlike my father, right? We can't be an environmentalist of the sort that we have our cabin in the hill. We have a high standard. We don't want anyone else to have it, too, because we want to keep our environment clean. Well, we somehow have to find a way to share while fighting climate change at the same time. And, and that is a very difficult problem, actually. So um, I think that's what you're getting at. Is that at least getting at your question? And then we'll hear what other people think the answers can be. But oh, is that at least addressing what you were asking? Was that what you were getting at? Uh, go ahead, Tyler. Um, in that video, it said that in the last 50 years, I think it was 50 years, that the population has gone up about two or two and a half times what it was, but the GDP of the nations has gone up five to six times, and a lot of other things have gone up more than the population. And he also says, you know, that there used to be five children born per family, and now it's down to 2.4 in the world. So that is, to me, this is one of the most encouraging things that we're already seeing, is at least on the population side, there's already been a huge drop over the last 50, 75 years. But, 
even though that's happening, there's still so much more greenhouse gases being produced that um, I think it's going to, you'll see, Elroy, as, as this goes along, that they'll be emphasizing that the population growth is a relatively small part of our problem compared to all the other things that are the affecting the sources or the sinks of the greenhouse gases. And to put that uh, population number into perspective, 2.4 is what we're at now. It used to be 5. 2.1 is replacement on average because of things like uh, right. mortality before having children and the number of people who don't have children. 2.1 keeps our population flat. Uh, so we're very rapidly approaching not only a place where it's flat, where it goes down. Which is actually kind of scary, I think, and despite... <laughs> I just have a, a comment, not actually a question. Um, sometimes I've, I've thought that, that the increasing longevi longevity of humans, I'm officially old now, so I can say this, um, <laughs> could be a problem with, with people hanging on and still contributing to the population number. However, um, I, I do think that older people have a better grip of because you can see further back. I was privileged to be in one of the uh, uh, first ecological, environmental ecological classes at NMSU, believe it or not, in 1972. People didn't want to talk about it then. And now, 50 years later, it's, it's much easier to speak about our problems and climate change, even though we had to change it for, from global warming because some people objected it is global warming. But anyway, so I think <laughs> perhaps it's useful to keep the old people around. <laughs> well, we certainly, uh, you know, the, the straw man approach to attacking this solution is, is, is was, I had this argument with my father, and he, he started talking about how, well, what do you want to do, just kill everybody? You know, that's not a very compassionate solution, because he saw that as the only solution. And, and this, this is a straw man, because it's not what any of us are proposing, right? Um, but, but what do we do instead? Um, because we, we compassionately care about, these, about people. And if we have a, an aging population who is not economically contributing but is still uh, economically spending, how do we care for them? That is a whole other debate besides just climate change. Related, but it's a huge problem we're going to face. And Japan is facing it. South Korea is facing it to an even greater degree than we are. We need to watch what happens here because where they are now, we will be in a few years, and it's actually one of the primary arguments, at least for the US economy, for immigration. We need to dramatically increase our, our immigration levels. Uh, but that, all that does is it sucks working age people from other countries, so at some point it's not, it's not a, a final uh, lasting solution for our problems uh, with, with aging populations and things. But again, there are benefits too. We'd have less people, we, we, we can do more for the environment, at least we don't want the world's uh, population growing exponentially forever. Um, that would be a problem. And, and luckily, we don't see that happening like we thought it was going to just a few years ago. So, um. towards, towards the end of the presentation, there was a, an attempt to make this... Uh, there, was, there was an attempt to make this positive uh, view as to what we can do in particular, uh, looking at the sinks. Right, and uh, plants being uh, one of the main sinks. Um, it is a little, maybe, maybe my view is incorrect here, but it's a little hard to imagine how we are improving in that respect with all the wildfires that are in turn triggered by uh, uh, global warming. And it brings the idea that maybe the water management is one of the main things we need to be focusing on on a global scale. Uh, I imagine it's parts, parts of the country maybe getting drier, parts of the country actually have plenty of water and we do not have efficient communication between the amount of water is getting in different places. Your thoughts? So I have, I have, a, I have a, maybe a, a counterintuitive stance on this, but it's, it's that um, water is actually a much bigger problem than climate change. Uh, and they're two are related. 
but uh, I think we're going to have a crisis of water long before we have a crisis of, of, of climate change. And it's not that we don't have enough water. We have plenty of water. It's just it's all, it's all salty. Uh, fresh water is very rare. We don't have enough of it. And, uh, and we're, using it, we're using it faster than we get it, primarily by draining our aquifers. The problem is we can't do that uh, indefinitely. Eventually, those aquifers run dry, and we're using them primarily for agriculture. Um, but we need that agriculture to support our larger population, or else a whole bunch of people starve to death, which isn't what we want, which means we're going to solve this water problem, or a bunch of people are going to starve uh, in, the, in the very near future. And so the water problem is, is actually a, maybe a bigger one than the climate change problem, uh, but we have to solve them both. And it's hard to solve one without the other, especially since uh, our farming costs so much of our, of our water. Worse, what we've done is we, we built our first cities. Where did we build them? In the middle of our agricultural zones because it was right near the agriculture. So now our cities are, are in our urban sprawl is taking up the prime agricultural land. And, and, and uh, the place is with some of the most water. Uh, and then we're trying to grow crops in, in less um, beneficial places, it seems like to me anyway. And we're trying to truck all this water into Vegas, right? I mean, uh, Vegas is one of these big cities with no water. Um, so anyway. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know of, of of people doing the same sort of solutions approach. In fact, the, the the water problem gets less press, it seems to me, than the climate problems, and and I'm not quite sure why, because they're both serious issues we need to somehow address. As you could sort of see, just in the intro unit, there was a lot of information. Well, this that's the way it's going to be in each unit. So you're going to if you come back next week, you're going to learn a lot more about all the different possibilities there are for looking at solution, at, um, sources of greenhouse gases and sinks, and then a whole section on how, to, how does this improve equality, equity, justice in the world. So just keep that in mind as you're sort of toying with questions and doubts. There's a lot more to come. Especially since we, the, the next section is all about solutions and we saw all the problems section and not the solution section. So he tried to be very upbeat and, and present a positive solution. I wonder if humans are, are actually smart enough to take those solutions, but, but nevertheless, there are solutions out there and he has a very upbeat view. We, we saw that even for his upbeat view, we saw the problem side and didn't see his proposed solution side. So those are coming, and, and I, I hope everyone can come back next week. Let's do one more question, and then I have to formally turn you loose because we're gonna, we, uh, we have our other RE classes are ending and parents have to grab children. But I'm happy to hang out after in a more informal way, and we can all chat and talk. And so, I just have, then I guess, the last question. Uh, will there be any discussion material about what could be going on locally in Los Alamos? It's one thing to talk about South Korea, but what could be going on locally? What could be done to contribute to a solution? The units are long enough that we don't have really sort of the time to go into that. Um, we will have Sarah Mason coming to the next session, and she's involved in efforts going on in the state um, to lobby for better climate policies, and um, she'll be talking briefly about how any of us who want to get involved with her work um, will be able to kind of potentially meet with her and, and do more in coming months. Um, but if you've got some, Bob, some info to bring about things going on locally, please do, and we could have handouts here. Please bring it next week. Um, well, there's a hand in the back. Um, I'm, I'm going to let everyone go kind of formally end, but if anyone wants to keep talking, and then at least their hand in the back, and, at least, and then uh, so we'll, we'll continue with an informal discussion, but anyone who needs to leave, that's also fine, obviously. Go ahead. Do, do you Go ahead. We've got time if you want to talk, right? I was just going to answer his question. Um, if you're interested, there is a great deal being done locally to address climate change, um, including a greenhouse gas analysis for the county and a climate action plan. 
Um, you'll be seeing a lot about that in the media in the coming months. In the meantime, you can check out the um, county's website, and uh, we have an environment, it, it's under environmental sustainability, drill down a bit and you'll see where these plans, wh what we're doing, uh, including water and energy conservation and shifting to low carbon energy sources, and then, as I mentioned, these uh, initiatives for analysis and a climate action plan, you can see a lot of detail about local activities on the county's website. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your coming. I would like to note that they did talk about sources and sinks, but they didn't mention that things like sinks usually have a saturation level and an analysis needs to be more complete. Uh, but sources have limits too, meaning life could be changing a lot. Yep. They, they do mention that later, but I, th I think they're, they're aware of the, the possibility of saturating some of our sinks. I, certainly for the ocean, um, some of that ocean sink is from biomatter in, in the ocean, but some of it is from uh, ocean acidification, which is its own problem. As we use the ocean as a car carbon sink, uh, it, it's harmful to some of the ocean, ocean life. Uh, and ocean acidification is one of the big downsides of, of our CO2 emissions, not just global warming. Get your pen. So that's not an, an unending sink. Um, which brings up, I think we're at the level where uh, this is, this is a, now I'm stepping s squarely in my own opinion, but I think we're at the level where some form of geoengineering is going to be necessary, and that's a dirty word among most climate scientists because it almost always has unintended consequences and it, and it may not even work. But we're going to have to, I think, remove CO2 actively ourselves. And, you know, so there, there, there were some of these early proposals, like what you can do is you could uh, take a, an ocean barge, and for about a million bucks, you can dump a whole bunch of uh, iron into the ocean. And the result of that, in, in the form of iron flakes, the result of that is a, is a really massive algae bloom. And the result of that is the sequestration of a whole bunch of carbon dioxide. Of course, as the algae sinks to the bottom, it decays and releases methane. Uh, and so one of the one of the open questions is does that does that approach make things a lot worse, or does it make them better? We don't even know, right? But um, I think it's time we we kind of wake up and realize we're going to have to start thinking about that because something like that is something is going to be needed because we're we're we released more CO two last year than we did the year before. So he's talking about drawdown, and that requires almost immediate reduction of of our emissions, and we're increasing our emissions. So we're at the point where you can produce kilowatt hours more cheaply through solar than you can burning coal and some of these other things. So natural economic forces are going to start pulling in, in kind of the right direction. On the other hand, we can't store it as easily, um, you know, so that's why we need nuclear as a solution. So some of these other things that, are, that we need are going to take time, and because they take time, we don't have time. We're going to have to do some sort of more uh, active mitigation, and, and we don't want to. And I, the problem is that people use that as an excuse not to be active in reducing emissions. We'll just do some geoengineering solution, and I think we need to reduce emissions immediately. But I don't see any way to do that that isn't also going to require some geo solutions, and that's going to require some scientific investigation and study, and we at least need to be willing to study it because we're going to need it. Whether we want to need it or not, we're going to and it will have unintended consequences and it's gonna be harmful in other ways and we're gonna to have to pick some lesser of two evils because we 